Uh, hello, everyone. We'll get started soon, but first, I have a favor to ask. So my guitar is not uh, plugged in today, so it's going to be hard for you guys to hear me. So if you can, please come over more to the front so you can actually hear the music. So I know you're all settled in. Stand up and come to the front as front as you. Yeah, the first two rows. Come on, Mia. <laughs> I see you. Come to the front. And you guys at the back, you can come one row to the front. <laughs> one more row. <laughs> Why are there two empty rows back there? Come on. <laughs> all right, all right. I won't force you too much. Thank you for all for those who move. Um, so we'll get started with uh, today's uh, worship. And uh, let's uh, quiet our hearts and focus our attention on God solely. Let's all please stand. And uh, we'll ask God to open our hearts to receive today's message. You stood before creation, eternity in your hand. You spoke the earth into motion, my soul now to stand. You stood before my failure. And carry the cross for my shame My sin weighed upon your shoulders My soul now to stand So what can I say? And what can I do? But offer this heart, oh God, completely to you. So I'll walk upon salvation, your spirit alive in me. Life to declare your promise, my soul now to stand. So what can I say? And what can I do? But offer this heart, oh God. Completely to you. So, what can I say? And what can I do? But offer this heart, oh God. Completely to you. With arms high and heart abandoned In all of the one who gave it all I'll stand my soul, Lord, to you surrendered all I am is yours So I'll stand with arms high and heart abandoned the one who gave it all I'll stand my soul Lord you surrendered all I am is your one more time so I'll stand with arms high and heart abandoned in all of the one who gave it all I'll stand my soul, Lord, you surrendered all I am is yours. 
these pieces broken and scattered in mercy gathered mended and whole empty handed but not forsaken i've been set free i've been set free sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me oh, oh, oh i once was lost but now i am found was blind but now i see oh i can see you down raising other broken to life you take our failures you take our set your treasure in jars of clay so take this heart lord i'll be your vessel the world to see your life in me oh amazing grace how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me oh, 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 oh i once was lost but now i am found was blind but now i see amazing grace how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me oh, oh was lost but now I am found was blind but now I see oh I can see you now oh I can see the love in your eyes laying yourself down You give life, you are love, you bring light to the darkness, you give hope, you restore every heart that is broken. And great are you. is your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise we pour out our praises your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise to you only you give life you are love you bring light to the dark
darkness you give hope you restore every heart that is broken and great are you your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise to you only and all the earth And all the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry, these bones will sing. Great are you, Lord. And all the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry, these bones will sing. Great are you, Lord. And all the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry, these bones will sing. Great are you, Lord. Is your breath. your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise to you only is your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise we pour out our praises your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise to you only You may take a seat. We'll invite Samuel up for today's message. Good morning. Let's pray, okay? Father God, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit, we give thanks to you for bringing us together this morning. Just as you said in Acts 1, 8, we will receive power and the Holy Spirit comes upon us and we will be your witnesses. Sometimes, dear God, dear Jesus, we feel like um, we are not powerful enough, we are not strong enough, we are not wise or smart enough to be your witness in everything, even to be a witness to ourselves. But you say, well, my grace is sufficient, is all your need, and my power actually is made perfect in your weaknesses. So dear Jesus, we come to you today with all our weaknesses, brokennesses, darknesses, because we believe that whenever we are weak, we are strong because of you. Please be with us. In your name we pray, amen. Okay, good morning everyone. So today we are going, yeah, it's a long, it's a long topic. Actually, I have to, I have to admit, I used ChatGPT to brush, I mean, to improve my topic. So ChatGPT insists on using this topic. So I was wondering, yeah, maybe I need to be submissive and obedient to ChatGPT. So anyway, so today we are going to talk about wisdom and learning and study. So we have, been we have been talking about wisdom for some time. Today, we want to talk about the connection between learning and wisdom. So my dear friends, 
actually, wisdom is all about learning. I think uh, our common sense may tell us, of course, that's nonsense, right? It's, uh, everybody knows that. Of course, wisdom is about learning, but how? Uh, first, please allow me to say, as we know, a person can be very moral. A person can be very moral, but still can be very unwise. You can, you can very quickly have some examples. We can be very moral, but be very foolish. So it's also possible to be very knowledgeable, but yet very foolish. Remember that, please. You, can, you and I can be very knowledgeable, but still we can be horribly foolish. For example, a social scientist may know everything about poverty, but he or she can still make things worse for a poor family by trying to help them. Or actually, um, a, a best friend of m my wife and I, she is a senior professor in a university. Teaching what? Teaching finance and investments. But the truth is, she never tried stock market in her whole life. And her husband teased her that she didn't even know how much money they have and how many bank accounts they have. But she knows everything about financial investments in the textbooks. She's an expert. And more specifically, me and my wife, we have spent over 15 years, actually 20 years, in theology and in human nature. Actually, me and my wife, we both have the certificate for premarital counseling and marriage counseling. Let me tell you the truth. Because we have so much knowledge about marriage, our marriage is in the paradise now. <laughs> it's, it's often in the hell. I will not judge for myself, so maybe you guys, if you're interested, you can ask my son. He may tell you the true answer. Just don't tell me what he tells you, right? Okay, please do me a favor. I don't want to know what he, want, he tells you guys. <laughs> so you know what? You can be very knowledgeable, but still you can be so stupid and foolish. So, my dear friends, there is knowledge without wisdom, but can we have wisdom without knowledge? See, can we have wisdom? Some people say, well, as long as you are wise. I mean, some religious people say, as long as I believe something, believe God, I mean, God will lead me. Can we have wisdom without knowledge? The answer is no, because we have to be knowledgeable about the subject before we can apply it within the discipline, discernment, and discretion of wisdom. For example, for example, we are all concerned about life and death, right? We are all concerned about life and death, and we are all concerned about relationship with our loved ones. To be wise in those areas, we have to at least learn and understand human nature, how human relationship work, suffering and death, and the character of God. You have to learn something about that. We cannot just assume what they are and how they work. If you insist, insist on, you know something about that without studying or learning, good luck. Good luck. So let's first look at the scripture for today. Oh. Sorry, try. Proverbs 1, 5, I'll read out. The Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel, let the wise listen and add to their learning. And let the discerning get guidance. Pay attention to the word learning. So Proverbs cause those who to be wise, who like to be wise, to add to their learning. So here the Hebrew word for learning is laka. It means extensive study. The Hebrew word is laka. Laka. Extensive study. So my dear friends, life is a school. You and I, the bad news or the good news, depending on how you approach it. The bad news or the good news is you and I will never graduate from this school. We'll never. We'll never before you die. So, learning is a lifelong journey, please. And it also means you are never too old to learn. If you think, oh gosh, Samuel, I'm too old to learn. 
Sorry, please, no. If life is a lifelong school, you are never too old to learn, please. So there is one, actually, there is one um, uh, definition of wisdom which I think the best describes the relationship between wisdom and learning, and I like it. I want to share with you. It says, wisdom is wedding thought and experience to become competent with regard to the realities of life. Wow, I like it. I hope you like it as well. It's, it's about wedding our thoughts and experience. What does that mean? It means wisdom is about our thoughts. And thoughts is about what? It's about our learning. So wisdom is inseparable to our thinking, please. Just remember that. And our thinking are based on what we learn and study. That's very important. Otherwise, you are just uh, having fantasies, reveries, daydreams. Understand what I mean? Your thinking is closely related to your study. Okay, the fact is our study guides and leads our thoughts. So to think, you and I must study. Here comes the question. You guys are experts, so I'll leave you guys to answer the question. How to be a good learner? How to be a good student? High schoolers, will you guys, want, will you guys contribute anything? How to be, I mean, if you, even if you fail in your exam, you can tell me the opposite. How to be a good student? Come on, we are all, we all have sort of high school diplomas, university degrees, master degrees. How can you? How to be a good student? Give me any hints, tips, come on. Ask questions. What else? Ask questions. Pardon? Focus. Very hard. What, what else? What's that? Open-minded. Good. What else? The high schoolers, they are really, they had some secrets they don't want to share with us, right? Because you guys are in <laughs> deep in study now. Andrew, I, I was told you are, you are in trouble, right? Studying all those kind of things. What's your secret? <laughs> Perseverance. Okay. Anyway. In the year 2005, in the year 2005, during his speech in the commencement, I mean graduation ceremony at Stanford University, Steve Jobs, he said something very famous. I bet every one of us here at least heard it once or twice, at least. You can bet. Do you want to have a bet? I bet you have listened. Steve Jobs, in the commencement of Stanford University in the year 2005, he said, to be a good student, stay hungry and stay well, foolish, right? Stay hungry and stay foolish. Well, my friends, today, let's look at these words. Steve Jobs is a figure high up there, and I'm just nobody. But still, I think I have some questions about the practicality of his words. We like to quote this, right? Like the chicken soup. Oh, stay hungry, stay foolish. How to put them into practice? How practical these words are? Or can we really apply these words in our lives? Okay, let's first see stay hungry. Okay, before we go deeper, stay hungry, let me ask you a question. How many of you guys feel hungry all the time? All the time, sir. Your wife treats you bad, really bad. I'm sorry. We provide free marriage counseling. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Serious. How many of you guys here, you feel hungry all the time, 24-7? You? <laughs> I cannot imagine someone who's hungry, right, 24-7. No, no, nobody is hungry all the time, right? Nobody first. So problem is, if you don't feel hungry, you don't feel wanting to eat, right? Unless you just want to take snacks every day. Unless, right? So for most of us, if we don't feel hungry, we don't feel like eating. So think about study. If, you don't, if I don't feel like hungry, I don't feel like studying. The same, okay. 
And if you say, Sammy, actually, you know what? I eat snacks every day. Okay, good. If you snacks every day, uh, I mean all day long, gradually, you will not feel like wanting to eat anything at all, right? Young mothers, please. Oh, grandma, grandpa, you guys, please tell me. Pa, please tell me your grandchildren, right? Lunchtime, no. I have already had enough what? Snacks, right? Potato chips, tortillas, whatever, chocolate. So if you eat snacks, the problem with eating snacks is if you have snacks all the day long, you will lose appetite. Or you will become very picky about food, right? You will be very picky. No, I don't like it. Mm, rice, what's, what's good about rice? What's good about spaghetti? I want... I want the, actually yesterday I talked with a group of Chinese people, we say, actually, all, no Chinese food here in town, in Calgary, is real Chinese food. All of them are fake. And Johnny said, Amen. How picky you are, gosh, it's a shame. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> it's a <okay>. kid. <laughs> so, and, <laughs> and there's another problem. If you, okay, especially girls, if you want to keep to have an incre incredible figure, what would you do? Hey, girls, if you want to keep a terrific figure, what would you do? You would not eat even when you are hungry, right? Am I right? Yeah, are you hungry? Yes, I'm hungry, but no. Mm, no, too much. See? So, if, so my, my point is, sometimes you, you just need to be careful. Hunger, the sense of hunger can be so deceptive and misleading. And seriously, let's say, be more scientific. Okay, let's be more scientific. If you are always hungry, my dear friends, if just like Johnny Ian or dear mister, if you say, oh, Samuel, I'm always, always hungry. Let me tell you what's wrong with you. Let me tell you. Clinically, clinically, there may be some with something wrong with you, either physically or mentally. For example, hyperthyroidism, something wrong with your thyroid, very likely, or type 1 and type 2 diabetes, very likely, or you are under great pressure, or you are suffering from various anxieties. Johnny, you have all of them. <laughs> all of them, okay, good. And by the way, my dear friends, especially for the high schoolers, especially for the high schoolers and our young adults, something for you to know, anorexia and bulimia. Anorexia means a strong hatred for food. May I say that in that way? Okay. Anorexia and bulimia are among the most common symptoms of mentally unwell people, especially among young people. See? They got disorder in their eating habits. So, on the other hand, my dear friends, anyone with uh, physical training experiences knows that you must have a healthy di dietary habits, right? Including when, what, and how much to eat, whether or not you're hungry. You agree or not? If you are under training, open, right? You have to. I have to be very disciplined in what I take. When, what, how much? Even when I'm not hungry, even when I'm not, I, I mean here, if you guys, anybody here has the experience of running marathon, one of the danger of running marathon is you have to drink water even when you are not thirsty. You have to. Otherwise, you'll be in great trouble. See, that's my point. And Last but not least, my dear friends, if you are, if you have ever had the experience of being super hungry, super hungry, like, uh, like starving, actually I have had, if you have ever had the experience of being super hungry, you will just eat almost anything available. You just eat everything. Let me tell you what I eat, okay? When I was a missionary in Mongolia, we eat bread with mold this thick. No exaggeration at all. You have to survive. 
So if you say, oh, I only eat when I'm super hungry, you will eat a lot of harmful, unhealthy stuff, harmful for your body. And if you feel like I, only, I will only study when I feel like I want it, you are taking a lot of wrong, wrong thing. That's my point. Likewise, my dear friends, if we are driven only by the sense of hunger, we'll end up learning something very, very unhealthy or, or even harmful. Okay. If we feel like we only need learning when we feel hungry, we'll either never form any learning habits. So my secret to learning is habit. I never trust anybody who can be a good student but doesn't have a good habit. I never, ever, and there is no such a person, at least not for my, I know, nobody. Okay, if you only learn when you feel like it, you will never have a good learning habit over time, or you will develop a very unhealthy learning pattern. Neither one is very helpful. We all know that constancy and consistency are the key to learning, right? Constancy and consistency. Okay, so if that's the case, if we stop learning, I mean, if we only learn when we want it, we don't have a good habit of learning, the result is we stop growing, or more specifically, we stop growing well and uh, healthy, and we'll never create a life beyond the one we have right now. Because without a good learning habit, the longer we live, the less pliable our minds are to learning. So we say, old, stubborn guy. Why? Because your minds are not pliable enough to more learning. You don't have the habit. You never flex your muscles. Sorry. So in this case, as we grow, we don't have the learning habits. In this case, we convince ourselves. We say, well, maybe I have learned enough. And I don't feel like learn any needs to learn at all, right? How many of you feel like, actually, I think, you know what? I think I have learned enough. Let me tell you a secret. As a former university professor, the first thing I told my students when they came to university, I told them, the beginning of your study starts from your graduation. So good news for all students. You are not yet study. You have not yet begun your study. So if you feel like, oh, I have graduated, I have had a degree, and I don't need to study, congratulations, good luck. You are stopping growing. I'm serious. I'm serious, my dear friends. For the young church, and those people, though they are old, but they are young in their hearts, that's something I want to, yeah, we can encourage each other. So we think we, 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 we don't need at all. We have learned enough. We, don't, we are not hungry, and we'll choose to simply work off what we know for the rest of our lives. How many of you are serious, even for the, in the field of your own study, how many of you haven't read a book, research, or any development in your own field for the past five years? The other day, I talked to two graduates from Yale University. They told me, Samuel, the easiest thing in the world, I mean Yale, oh, Yale people, they say, the easiest thing in the world is to get a doctoral degree. I'm sorry, excuse me, what do you mean? Actually, me, my son, my wife, we, we were there when they talked to us, and they said, you know why it's easy? Because for doctoral study, those knowledge are just like 50 or 100 years ago. It's easy. They will not never change. I was like, oh, I can see the difference now. <laughs> So my dear friends, think about it. Okay? I, I hope you guys can be serious about yourself, about life. Because, because you know what? If you stop learning, if you feel like, I don't need to learn anymore, we, we will convince ourselves that somehow what we already know will take us wherever we go in our lives. You may not think that. In, I mean, 
very clearly in your mind, but subconsciously you feel like, oh, I have enough. I have enough to navigate my life. But that's dangerous. So maybe you found a way to pay the bills. You were able to get that eight to five job, pay the rent or mortgage, and put gas in the car. And result? What's the result? The result is, even if you feel the life being sucked out of you by the mundane, you stop being curious and learning and exploring because you feel like your life is manageable. You feel like your life is manageable. Yeah, it's manageable. So you will give up your learning and exploring in exchange for comfort and security and predictability. But my dear friends, life teaches us how uncomfortable, how insecure, and how unpredictable they are, right? I think the first lesson life will teach us is they are never insecure, they are never predictable, they are never comfortable. That is exactly why so many people's perfect life crumbles in, a, in, a, in an instant when something new happens or some change occurs. I bet you guys have such people in your life, or yourself, maybe even. Your perfect life just crumbles all of a sudden when something new happens. Right? Their thoughts and experiences can no longer be wedded to the facts, to the everyday changing. Because they stop learning, or they just keep on learning the wrong stuff. That is why we see so many grumpy and lonely old people in the world. <laughs> Not that only old people become grumpy or lonely, it's just that as we grow old, it will be more obvious. Instead, my dear friends, Instead of stay hungry, I would suggest we may try something different. We might try something, stay curious. What does curious mean? Curious means the passion for discovery and exploring. That's exactly a gift of God. Okay, just pay attention, please. If you do not believe God, I mean, if you don't trust God, literally, literally trust Literally trust in Hebrew language and in Greek language, uh, believe means depend on, like a recliner. You can just, uh, you can just uh, put your whole weight on it. That's what believe means in the Bible. If you don't believe God in that way, I don't care whether you call yourself a Christian or whether you have been baptized or whether you attend a small group or a church or even go to missions. I don't care at all. I only care whether you really believe God. If you don't, it's impossible for you to imagine what's worth exploring in your daily routine and mundane. Because you don't believe there is an infinite and loving God. You can't. You lose the capacity. The door is closed to you. You just cannot. You feel like everything is it's in a closed system. Only when you believe in infinite God can you just like, uh, yeah, Charles says, open-minded. Can you believe there is an open universe, there is an open infinity in your lives as well? That's the truth. So if you truly believe God, my dear friends, let me share with you another good news. A person of faith is never afraid to explore or to ask questions. We, above all else, a person of faith, a person who believes in Jesus Christ, above all else, we are driven to question, to examine, to learn. So, one thing for you to examine, whether you are a real Christian is, whether you are driven to really question the Bible, really question Christianity, really to examine. You know, let me tell you something. My, one of my favorite authors, uh, G.K. Chesterton, has ever said. He said, one of the measurements of a true religion is whether we can make fun of it. Wow. Wow. 
Gosh, that's profound. Think about it. Am I confident enough? Am I secure enough about my faith that I can make fun of it? Think about it, my dear friends. How many of you, as you grew up, especially those who grew up in the church environment, I mean, Sunday school, blah, 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 whenever you have a question about God, Adam and Eve, uh, Satan, your parents or the Sunday school teacher or even your pastor will say, hey, have faith, don't, don't ask too, so many questions. Whoever had such experiences, please raise your hand. Similar, please, come on. Only you, Johnny, poor Johnny, only me and you. Nobody else, because they don't never ask questions, right? I come here for the food. I come here because my fa- parents want me here. I don't have any questions. I used to have a lot of questions, and people would say, hey, Samuel, that's dangerous. Have faith. I was like, oh. never ever do this to the next generation, please. Real faith, above all else, will drive us to question, to examine, to have doubts. Faith, sorry, faith shouldn't make us less curious, but insatiably curious. Let me say that again. Faith will not make us less curious, but insatiably curious. Why? Because you have to believe there is something out there. You have to believe something is worth studying and that they are good. You have to believe. This means there has to be an infinite and loving God who is, re- who is willing to relate to us. You have to believe that for you to be curious. Otherwise, you will not. Think about it, okay? Actually, what I have just said is the foundation of the development of modern science. If any of you here is interested in the development, the the science history for the past 500 years, you will know what I have just said are the foundation for modern science history. And if you have really interest and you are serious enough, please, I will encourage you to read a book, one of my favorites. Very readable, very interesting, intriguing, very readable, please. The name of the book is The Soul of the Science. The Soul of Science, authored by Nancy Pierce. Please read it. You will feel so proud of being a Christian. Oh, I now realize science is developed on the basis of Christianity. And we provide momentum and drive for them. Otherwise, modern science will just die. Trust me, read the book and we can talk about it you'll suddenly realize how shallow and stupid I am to trust only science and technology. I do not mean to despise it. I just want you to know uh, if you, if you uh, appreciate or admire knowledge and science so much, learn to appreciate and admire something behind it. The foundation is more important, please. Okay? The soul of science. The soul of science, okay, please. Okay, the next, Steve Jobs says, stay hungry, which is stay curious. The second thing is stay foolish, right? Stay foolish. Here, in the same way, I'm wondering how practical this can be. Why? We sometimes think, oh, stay foolish is a good thing, right? Oh, stay foolish, stay foolish. But I really, just to be on the street level, on the street level, how practical this can be. Why? Because first, we human beings, just be honest with yourself, okay, my dear friends, I need your attention here. Just be honest with yourself. We may think we are not as tall as somebody else. For example, I'm, uh, I, I'm not as tall as Caden. You, 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 you may say, I'm not as strong as somebody, you know, I'm not as strong as Charles. I'm not so athletic as somebody like Johnny, like uh, Andrew, right? I'm not so well-educated, we're married, we're parented as others, but we never, deep in our hearts, we never, as human beings, we never think we are more foolish than anyone else. Do you agree or not? We never think, come on, who the hell is this guy? I don't think, right? We never, that's, 
we never think we are more foolish than anyone else. Instead, we, th we tend to think we are at least as smart as them. And often, we think we outsmart them in many ways. <laughs> Come on, just be honest. <laughs> right? Just be honest. The Bible gives us a very good reason for this mentality. We'll talk about it later, okay? And second, we realize in surprise that fools and foolishness are always negative. They have negative implications in the Bible. Serious. If you happen to read the Bible, you, you, you suddenly realize that actually fools and foolish always have negative implications in the Bible. It's never kind of a virtue something, especially in the book of Proverbs, right? In both the Old and New Testaments. And we'll talk about foolishness actually after we finish the wisdom part. So what's the alternative then? I mean, for us, we cannot even process the word foolish. How can we stay foolish? That's my question. If you cannot accept the word foolish, how can you stay foolish? Instead, the alternative uh, I would suggest is the actually, the Bible gives us the answer is stay humble. Why? Just as we have mentioned earlier, wisdom is wedding our thoughts and experiences, right? To become competent with regard to the realities of life. So that means thoughts come from learning. That makes something very important. What's that? To think properly, we need to study properly. Study properly suggests there is a proper way and a proper order to study. Let me give you for instance. Before that, just please be honest with me, okay? How many of you, what's your status quo of prayer life and worrying life? How often do you worry on a weekly basis? Lots. Mi on minute basis, hourly basis, daily basis? I think I'm a warrior. W-O-R-R-I. Not, not W-A-R-I. <laughs> I'm a warrior. I'm a warrior. Let me tell you, if you don't feel like worry, you're not old enough. You're not old enough. Okay, let me ask you another question. How many of you guys, serious, no, no, I'm not talking about religion, please. I'm, my determination is to be a typical pastor. So we're not, I'm not talking about religion. Let me ask you guys, how often do you pray, real pray? You may think, oh, you see, Samuel, you're still a pastor. Yeah, say in pray, worry. Okay, let me tell you something. Can you think of any relatedness between worry and prayer? Serious. No religion. Can you think of any relatedness between worry and prayer? You can't. Can you? Anybody? Any thoughts? Okay, let me give you a hint. Worry and pray, actually, they are both our mental activity of thinking. Right? These, they share in common. They are, they are both our mental activity of thinking. What's the difference then? So, we can see a lot of guys, when they are, they are really in, in deep trouble, they are worrying and they say, I'm thinking. Actually, they are worrying. <laughs> And many people say, oh, Sammy, I don't know how to pray. No, actually it means think. What's the difference? Okay, let me tell you. I hope this can be of some help. It can be of some help, okay. Think without God means worry. Think with God means pray. That's simple. If you have never tasted think with God, maybe you have never really prayed or maybe you have never experienced the power of prayer. <laughs> I'm sorry. I have been, I think I have been through enough troubles 
and sufferings to testify to this. That's simple. They are all thinking. Both of them are thinking activities. But the only difference is one is to think without God. The other is to think without, with God. So there is a proper way and proper order to study. So to study properly, where should we start then? According to the Bible, on top of all other things, we should study true wisdom. Uh, on, on top of all the other things we need to study, we need to have a deep knowledge of the Bible. Why? It's very important. I'm not bluffing. You will naturally ask why. Please ask me why, okay? Please. Always bombard me with questions. I'm not afraid of questions. I'm afraid you guys don't have questions. You, you, you will say, why, Samuel? We'll discuss it next time, the week up next. Next week, Johnny will introduce us a mystery guest. Mystery guest. Let's anticipate it, and please feel free to bring your friends. Today, we are going to restart our communion because I have talked to our young leaders, and I'm so glad our young leaders they feel like because of the Christian life, because of the Christian world, uh, um, belief, they feel like this ritual is a healthy one. The reason why I hold back communion is I don't want you guys to, to, to experience too much religion before you can really taste, taste the, the goodness of belief. So my young leaders told me they want to have this communion in remembrance of Jesus Christ and in remembrance of his teaching that we are one in him. So today, we are going to restart our communion as roots, and we'll do it once a month. And for the first two restarted, I'm honored to have our most respectable, most loving, most second handsome, but me, Pastor Pa, to do the communion for us today. Okay, let's welcome Pa. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Samuel, for uh, uh, introducing Already. me. I don't think I'm either the handsomest or the rest, but I, I am really passionate about one thing. Uh, I want to live for Christ. My, my hero, the Apostle Paul, said, <coughs> for me to live is Christ. And uh, I hope you can see that in me and uh, I can model that. I'm not there yet, but I want to be that kind of person. Uh, we have two practices in churches. <coughs> uh, the word church <coughs> means the called out ones. And uh, churches mostly didn't have buildings for 300 years. They met in homes or whatever, <clears throat> but they were family. Churches aren't like families. They are families. These are your brothers and sisters for not just the rest of your life or the time you're here, but for eternity. Uh, I had a friend in camp when I was 18 in uh, uh, New Mexico, and when we said goodbye, she said, here, there, or up in the air. I've never seen her since. But she means we're going to be together because we're eternally connected to Jesus. We're followers of Jesus. So Christians in churches do two things, two practices. One is baptism, which is individual. And one is communion or Eucharist or Lord's Supper, different terms for the same thing. And it's together, Lord's Supper. I grew up as a kid where we had breakfast, lunch, and supper. And when I became a young adult, I realized how unsophisticated I was. It should be breakfast, lunch, and dinner, right? Supper. Supper means to sup, right? To eat together. 
And uh, so that word is very significant. Then last night, Jesus is with his disciples, all 12 of them. The last night, um, they're having a Passover supper. And they're honoring what had happened centuries ago when God had taken the slaves out of Egypt through Moses. And uh, Jesus changes that radically. He makes the Old Covenant, the Old Testament, obsolete. And he says, I'm going to make a new covenant. Let's, let me just help you understand that supper. Uh, the disciples were arguing with one another, murmuring with one another. You know what they were discussing? Who's the greatest? I'm better than you. You're a loser, right? And Peter, most of all, because he at one point said, they'll all run away and fail you, but Jesus, I won't, I'll die for you. So that's the kind of people that were participating in what we're talking about. Actually, Judas was there too. And Jesus calls him out because Judas is going to turn rogue and betray Jesus. And in Matthew, I read this last night, Jesus said it would be better for that person if he were never born. He's in that group, right? And yet Jesus allows him to participate but allows those guys. Well, the other thing is, when you came into a meal like that, you know, if I come to your home in the wintertime, what do you do? Uh, can I take your coat and here, put your shoes here and here's some slippers, right? You, you act like a host and somebody should have done that at that meal and washed the feet of people because they wore sandals. But none of those disciples are gonna do that, right? Like, I'm not gonna wash your feet. Like, you wash my feet. That's their spirit. I'm showing you like how unholy they were, how unlike Jesus they were. And so do you know the story? Jesus took off his cloak and wrapped a towel around him and he went around and he washed their feet. It's amazing. Christians believe Jesus is the son of God. He made the whole universe and everything in the universe worships him and here he is at this supper, down on his knees, washing their feet. Peter said, no, you can't do that to me. No, no, no. And Jesus said, if you don't let me, you don't belong to me, Peter. So Peter, who's always in control, he said, okay, wash all of me. <laughs> you know, he, he wants to boss Jesus around, and Jesus is the boss, and he's the servant. So I'm giving you the setting, right? It's, it's a supper. Supper is what you do with family where you're just comfortable. These are my siblings. I, I grew up in a family of seven kids, and so we had nine around the table at some point, and so it was just family, right? And you realize they're not perfect, uh, but it's the Lord's Supper. And that word's really important. It's the Lord. In the minute, I'm going to say to you, if Jesus is your Lord, if you've decided, I'm not going to be the boss of my life, I'm not going to run it, He's the one I let run my life. He's my Lord. He's the driver. I'll go over in the passenger seat. This, this is his supper. This is his supper. Let me cue on something that Samuel just said, because I think it's really helpful for us. He talked about foolishness, and he's going to elaborate on that in future uh, dis, uh, uh, teachings to us. But Christians are fools. And actually... Paul, the missionary, the apostle, he, he called it the foolishness of the cross. You realize how, how utterly idiotic it is that we follow someone who wasn't on a power trip and didn't conquer with an army and served and loved and gave himself away and then died like a common criminal. Romans would not be crucified on a cross because it's so shameful, and Jesus was. And so we follow a crucified servant, a nobody, and it was astounding in the early days of the church, and it is to us now. Uh, actually, Jesus says he has scars on his hands and his feet and his side, because forever he'll remind us of what's most important, sacrifice, what, what, how did he define love? Uh, greater love is no one than this. 
than a person would lay down their lives for a friend or another. So he modeled that. And he's totally loyal to the father, right? Father asked him to do this, and he said, take this cup away from me, you know, the suffering I'm going to face. I'm going to drink the sins of every person and the guilt and the evil that I've done to myself and to others and God and the world, and I'm going to absorb all of that and be punished as the worst sinner. He said, take it from me, but then he said, no, but not my will, but yours be done. So the Lord's Supper brings us uh, out of the culture you know, Samuel talked about how churches can get into religion and, you know, that can be dress codes and diets and ways you have to live and the other. And it brings us right to the center of this person, Jesus. Jesus. And you can have a personal relationship with him. Baptism says, personally, I die to Jesus. Uh, to myself, I'm sorry. I died to myself. I go under the water and I come alive because I, I want people to know I'm not going to live this life anymore. I'm going to live the life Jesus gives me. And baptism says I'm going to be part of God's family. As weak as we are, as struggling as we are, as worried as we are, there's a church in Colorado Springs that had scandals. Uh, a mega church, actually. I watched a podcast of a guy associated in it and um, <clears throat> their senior pastor was a, like a brilliant superstar in the Christian community. And then he was scandalously, uh, you know, ruined his life. And then they had a shooting out in the parking lot. And it, like some people were killed. And so they, they faced all of this trauma and drama. And they were evaluating like what's wrong. And, and uh, they came to a point to say the only thing we do in our church that isn't surround, doesn't surround personality, doesn't lift up a, like a superstar, like their praise team leader was so talented and their pa pastor. The only thing we do that isn't focused on people is this Lord's Supper because it makes us go back and focus on Jesus, not, not any leader, not anybody else. And bring, bring us to a point of saying, Jesus, I want to follow you. I'm not perfect. I can fit in with those disciples. I don't want to be a Judas. I don't want to be a Peter, so proud. Jesus, I, I want to humble myself, like uh, Samuel said. And I, I want to be a follower of yours. I'm not holy, but I want to be holy, whatever that means. I want to be loyal to the Father. So the, the Lord's Supper is very powerful. It, it brings us back to our roots, our roots. Churches do it in different ways. I was in Tallinn, Estonia, the capital of Estonia. I was there with a missionary, and we came in on a Sunday morning. He said, oh, let's sit right up at the front. So we sat at the front, and then I said, why? Like, why? He said, well, it's, it's communion this morning, and they just have one cup, and they pass it all around. <laughs> so you want to sit at the front, right? So sometimes churches do that. I work with a church in Edmonton. They have the Lord's Supper every Sunday night. They meet in the evening. And they break into groups, and they have three and three and three, and you go get the elements, you know, the wine, the grape juice, and the bread, and you participate. I'm showing you, church, Jesus didn't say you have to do it in a certain way. He just said as often as you do it. And so churches form their own culture. But basically, it's because we say, Jesus, we, we, we don't want to be religious. You hate religion. We want this relationship with you, and we want to renew it with you. Each morning, I pray a prayer out of the Anglican book of common prayer. I'm not Anglican, but I really like it because it's a confession. It says, um, I have left undone things I ought to have done, and I've done things I ought not to have done, and there is no health in me. But thou, O Lord, have mercy on me for Jesus' sake and his merits. I want to start every day saying, Lord, I'm not perfect. Only you're perfect. And so I want to get it out front to confess this. And God, I need your mercy and your grace. And I want to go through this day with the kind of joy instead of grumpiness. Like I'm 73 years old. I should be grumpy, right? I want to go through my day with joy. 
because Jesus said, the joy of the Lord is my strength, right? So we're going to celebrate uh, the Lord's Supper uh, this morning. We have a dilemma, because this is, uh, we're, we're beginning it again, and when they uh, counted how many uh, cups we have, we only have 21. So Samuel's gone around and asked the leaders, don't participate, or do it virtually. Could we say that? <laughs> do it virtually, because we, we literally don't have enough. But we're going to put uh, a table in front. In fact, Jetty, would you take that and, and just put it in front, that stool? And in a moment, I'll pray, and, uh, and then you can come up and serve yourselves. Like, please do come up and serve yourself. We want to make sure uh, everyone uh, participates, and I think next time we'll, we'll, we'll have enough to do it. Let's first pray. We'll take just a moment, maybe just a minute. And I won't pray, but you pray. And you can personalize that uh, I have left undone things I should have done. And I've done things I shouldn't have done. There's no health in me without you, God. Please have mercy on me because of Jesus' merits, because of what he did in my place. Lord, we just, we just acknowledge we drift away from you. Uh, you say we're like sheep, and sheep are great at drifting away. And so we're glad to come to a place where you come for us. Uh, your word uses the picture, uh, come to the light, walk in the light. And, of course, we often go into the dark, Lord. We just confess that, too. So right now we come to the light as you're in the light. And it says we, we have communion with one another this is our family and the blood of jesus your son cleanses us from all sin we we want that cleansing we don't we don't want to stay in the dark we don't want to stay in guilt we don't want to stay in fear in worry and, and especially in 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 defeat we we come to you jesus cleanse us strengthen us may this lord's supper uh, it's a symbol but may the reality be we're empowered by you what you did we're strengthened by you. In Jesus' name, amen. It says Jesus at the Last Supper took a, a, a loaf of bread and broke it and said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Then he took a, a cup of wine and said, this is my blood, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. He called it the new covenant he's making on our behalf with the Father. So if he is your Lord, then the Lord's uh, table, the Lord's Supper, is available for you. So let me encourage you, just come and take it, and then we'll participate together. You have to stand. <laughs> you have to come. Nobody's going to serve you. I want you to come and say, this is for me. know how to use these and the top is a wafer so you have to open it up this is my body Jesus said This is my blood, which is shed for many for the forgiveness of sins. New Year's Eve, about 2015, 16, 
the team to Antakya. Uh, Shelley was part of that team. I think there's seven of us. And on New Year's Eve, we met in a room, a long, narrow room. I bought a bottle of wine from an Armenian church just to, I don't know, just to treat them well. We had a baguette, you know, a French baguette. And uh, so we had a dinner with the Turkish church and uh, Syrians and Chinese and English. And um, the pastor said, Paul, do you want to lead in communion? Pastor Jakob and I said well we have a bottle of wine and someone went and got it we have a baguette so this humble group of people multi-ethnic from you know different groups we just took our coffee cups and poured a little wine in it passed the baguette around and took a little piece off of it is one of the most um, meaningful times in my life this is why Jesus came we all, you know, races and tribes fight against one another. Racism is so powerful. And Jesus said, no, I came to bring you together. One new community, one new family. So that's what's happening here. And all that God will bring us. And uh, I hope as we celebrate this month by month, it becomes more and more meaningful. Jesus, you on the cross, you in the resurrection, that's changed my life. Wakey, let's sing. Let's all please stand. As we eat the bread and drink the wine, um, remember that God has called us no matter what, uh, where we are and who we are, and he's called us to come to him no matter how undeserving we are as well. He opens our arm, he opens his arms and accepts us. Let's sing this uh, worship song as an answer to his call. who stray come sit at the table come taste the grace there's rest for the weary rest that endures earth has no sorrow that heaven can cure so lay down your burdens lay down your shame your face a wanderer come home you're not too far so lay down your hurt lay down your heart come as you are come as you are 
has no sorrow that heaven can heal. Earth has no sorrow that heaven can heal. So lay down your burdens, lay down your shame. All who are broken, lift up your Take a seat. Morning. Um, announcements. So, for youth, we have uh, we have a hike going on uh, this coming Saturday. Uh, we're going to arrange rides and stuff. Uh, we're going to post it on Discord. Um, so, be looking forward to seeing. Uh, you guys there uh, for uh, what else? Lunch, yes. Um, there's pizza at the cafeteria in the back. <coughs> so after this, uh, feel free to make your way back and uh, have fellowship and get to know each other more. Um, I think uh, today's message, uh, what I really got out of it was, um, yeah. Um, just to, I guess, not stay in a comfort zone um, and, you know, um, get into that daily routine where I'm just trusting on, uh, you know, my own, uh, my own self, like um, believing that I can, uh, you know, handle the um, outcomes and be in control uh, of my life, but really to involve God, um, especially in prayer and I think that's what really, like, that's what I really got out of today's message. So um, I think one of the ways to do that is uh, to help um, set up and uh, to give um, cheerfully. Uh, so uh, those are all the announcements for uh, this week. Um, and I think Samuel's new quote is, stay curious and stay humble. So have a great Sunday.